I cannot tell you the investment that I made in working with a, a qualified, competent attorney who who has experience in the in the arena. It was worth every penny that I invested, and I it wasn't an expense. I didn't call it an expense. It was an investment because it saved me a lot of headache and time to make sure everything was proper and done along the way. Welcome to the Veterinary Blueprint Podcast, brought to you by Butler Vet Insurance, hosted by Bill Butler. The Veterinary Blueprint Podcast is for veterinarians and practice managers who are looking to learn about working on their practice instead of in their practice. Each episode, we will bring you successful proven blueprints from others both inside and outside the veterinary industry. Welcome to today's episode. Welcome to this episode of the Veterinary Blueprints Podcast. I am your host, Bill Butler, and today we're joined by Michael Selchert, an attorney and shareholder with Larkin Hoffman in Minnesota. Michael is based in Minnesota and Texas and has extensive experience helping veterinarians with buying and selling practices, forming professional corporations and partnerships, advising veterinarians on contracts for employment, partnerships, real estate, and other business-related matters. So, Michael has extensive experience in all of those areas. We both are uh, members of the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association, which is how Michael and I got connected. And I'm just grateful to uh, have him join and share his insights with some recent changes for uh, small businesses. And we're going to speak about how that affects Minnesota business owners and veterinarians, but then also some larger scale items. So welcome, Michael. Thanks a lot, Bill. I appreciate you having me on your podcast. Uh, A little background. uh, uh, for me, as I, um, in my previous career, I was working in the dental field um, uh, for a manufacturer for many years, and then I went back to law school, and I became an attorney, and I saw an opportunity where uh, the dentists or the practitioners would be retiring because they're part of the baby boom generation, and uh, so I started helping them with their transitions and it also moved over to veterinary practices which I really enjoy working with veterinarians to help them sell their businesses and also new veterinarians to help them buy and uh, it's been great creating a network of other advisors like Bill to work with so we could be a team and help the uh, veterinarians be as successful as they possibly can. So I think that's really critical for entrepreneurs in general is just building a good team or network of advisors, whether that's attorneys, CPAs, insurance, or other, you know, I think, I think they, that often gets lost and you don't realize what you need until you go, Oh, I I don't know how to put an employment agreement together. uh, Or I don't know how to do insure something, or I'm going to buy a building. What, what are the implications of that? It's not just working with the real estate agent. It's also, uh, some contractual stuff. So I'm glad to have you on the podcast today, especially to talk about some timely, um, some timely issues that um, are are recent legislative issues and are changing the landscape of owning uh, owning a small business, specifically a veterinary practice. So uh, I'm glad you could join us today. You and I were uh, chatting before. Um, scheduling the podcast. And, and one thing that you mentioned to me that kind of, I was like, oh, uh, tell me more was the Corporate Transparency Act and how that's going to affect small businesses. And, you know, in, in the world of entrepreneurship, legislation gets passed and all of a sudden, boom, you've got to make changes as a business owner. And sometimes you're not up on stuff. So why don't you walk us through what the Corporate Transparency Act is? Transparency Corporate Transparency Act is, and how that's going to affect small businesses and what they can do to uh, make sure they're up to speed on that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a movement toward uh, at the federal level to create an act or legislation to help identify owners of shell companies uh, in order to fight terrorism. Right now, uh, the United States, uh, prior to this act, was one of the few economies that allowed an anonymous uh, ownership to exist on public records. And so uh, it was really difficult for uh, the FBI or other um, investigative agencies to find people who own these LLCs that could be 
shell companies, laundering money, terrorist organizations, or, or whatnot. And most of these existed at the lower level of businesses, these small business entities. And uh, the larger ones, the public companies, that information is easy to follow, or if they're licensed for some reason or whatever, uh, or whatever they're doing, then they have that information already. So, so they passed that act, and that act is going to go into effect on January 1st. And you have one year from uh, January 1st to report who the beneficial owners are of each company, unless, the, unless there's an exception that doesn't require you to report. But mostly, most, of, most small businesses will have to report. And then after January 1st, if a new business is created, you'll have uh, 90 days to make the report. Um, uh, and you make the report to the, uh, let me look this up quick. Um, it is the, uh, la la la. Excuse me, it's a financial criminal. It's FinCEN. A FinCEN. FinCEN. Yeah, the financial yeah. criminal investigation agency. So anyway, sorry I forgot about that. <laughs> or not forgot, but it's it's a lot of acronyms. That's okay. Hard to well, it is the so, it is please. the government, so they, they love the acronym stuff. So so just to just to clarify, January first, all small private entities, we're just gonna paint a broad brush. All small private entities are going to be required to register with SINFIN, which is a, a federal organization, with who the, the the primary beneficiary is for that business. Correct. Uh, and basically the rule there is uh, the controlling owner with 25% or more of an interest or financial ownership in the company. And they're going to have to reveal their you know, tax ID number, where they live, what their name is, and some other information as well. So, uh, and, and the definition I, for- I'm just, my, my pause, Michael, is this. My pause, Michael, is this. What you're telling me as a small business owner, entrepreneur, for the first time, live on this podcast, is I'm going to have to go and report my home address, my federal tax ID number, my controlling interest in- my parent organization for Butler Vet Insurance. That's your, and I've got to go register that with the federal government. Well, you may not because you might be under one of the exceptions. Gotcha. Uh, insurance agencies may be an exception. Um, oh, uh, how about that? But veterinarians most likely would be captured in this. Um, oh, absolutely. Veterinarians are going to be you because you're licensed in other ways you may you may not have to report you have to look at those exceptions and see if they apply to you um, gotcha but anyway uh, one of the big exceptions is uh, whether or not you're a small company and a small company is defined as a company with less than 20 employees and uh, with revenue less than five million dollars a year and I think probably 90% of the vet practices out there fit that category. So I, Yeah, I mean, if we use the 80-20 rule, I mean, I look at my own practice and probably yours, right? I mean, 80% of the practices we work with are under $5 million in revenue and most likely under 20 yeah. employees. I mean, that's, that's the vast majority. Right. So they're going to get r rolled into that. Yeah, so they'll need to file an interest. Already existing companies will have one year to file. They'll have until January 1st of 2025 to file with FinCEN. Gotcha. But if you're, if, but if you're a, a practice forming a new corporation and you help veterinarians, uh, you know, new corporate filings, they're going to have to file when they do their corporate filing. They're going to have to file with SINFIN as part of their corporate organization if they're going to start a practice or, or use that entity to purchase a practice on an acquisition. Correct. If they if they form the company, and and one of the kind of base rules here is if you are filing with the Secretary of State, that's the, that makes you 
the kind of entity that they want the reporting from. And if you file after January 1st of 2024, you'll have to file with FinCEN within 90 days. So 90 days. A whole year, but if you file after January 1st, you have 90 days. So February 2nd, I decide I'm going to start a corporation as a veterinarian to do an acquisition. Within 90 days of February 2nd, I have to not only get my corporate stuff, I file my corporate stuff February 2nd. Those are the articles of incorporation date. I've got 90 days to file with SINFIN to get my, or FinCEN to get my compliance, air quote, for those listening, not watching. Yeah, and and there's some stiff penalties if you're not in compliance. Well, it's the federal government, Michael. I would expect stiff penalties, if nothing less. (laughs) Plus criminal penalties if you're doing it intentionally. So, Uh, I mean, I'm looking at, I mean, you sent over a, what are we talking about here? This is a 35-page document or something from September 23, which is probably the document you're reviewing uh, at the exact same time, and it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, well, I, I think that goes back to your original comment about making sure that you're networking with appropriate people inside of your sphere and that way they can look out for your best interests, right? Right. Well, that's right. If anyone's listening to this, I'm sure Bill can provide my email address and I could, and if you want to contact me, I have my paralegal will help you file the, file it or answer any questions you might have. So. I mean, yuck. We're, we're, Who is the beneficial owner of my company? A to all our clients, so. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the importance of working with an, a, a legal professional who has experience in the in the veteran industry. So what are, you know, beyond the the kind of vanilla legal contract, articles of incorporation, purchase a purchase of practice, what are some things that you think veterinarians it's it's critical for them to to kind of have a handle on from a legal perspective where they may be getting into trouble just as a business owner in their in their sphere in their industry well uh there's a few things i mean they're if they're hiring other vet veterinarians other dbms and they're going to have employment agreements so they need to make sure that their employment agreements are in line with um, what's required in Minnesota. Uh, another area is the, uh, the board, excuse me, my phone. Um, the, other, the other area is a board of uh, veterinary medical um, licensing. And so you have to make sure that you're also uh, in compliance with their requirements as well. Sometimes you people get a follow of those. And also real estate. I run into a lot of stuff with real estate where people get into leases or um, situations with obligations that they didn't realize they had prior to, uh, you know, sending a document over to a legal professional and have them review it or Um, Or if you own real estate, whether or not you have, um, you're in compliance with the American Disabilities Act or other uh, zoning. I actually just had a claim get filed against one of my clients for ADA because their ramp ramp wasn't the proper degrees on their handicap accessible ramp. Yeah, I run into that stuff all the time. I I was talking to a vet today uh, because he had, he had a patient or a client um, dispute a charge and uh, and basically take some uh, prescribed medicine for their animal and leave without paying. So I had a long conversation with that particular vet on how to pers- you know how to handle that situation. So it, I want to jump back to the lease things. agreement thing. Yeah, so there you know there's there's no end to uh, trouble that I think business owners and veterinarians can get into. I want to jump back to the lease comment for just a second, just be their statement, because, you know, I'm, I am not an attorney. I'll preface my statement right now. I'm not admitted by any bar in any, uh, in any state or uh, the American Bar Association like you are, Michael. Um, but so often I, I see my clients and veterinarians say, Hey, you know, I, I'm, 
I'm moving into this space or I'm, I'm purchasing a practice and they've already signed the lease agreement and they send it over for to me because I've got to comply with the, you know, I don't give them any sort of legal advice on the, the lease itself, but I've got to interpret the, the insurance requirements. And I think, did, did anybody look at this before you signed this agreement? Because you, you're required to carry a $5 million umbrella now. And, and, you know, I think you, you could probably speak to this better than I can is that, everyone's always trying to pass the buck and in lease agreements, the landlord's trying to pass it contractually to the leasee. And, and, and so you really want to have somebody review those documents before you sign them because now you're contractually obligated to comply with them. Well, right. I think um, sometimes uh, clients, when I'm talking to them after they've signed a lease agreement without any advice, they'll discover that a lot of the risks, within that agreement is on their side of the ledger. And there was no negotiation. So, and they're responsible for things that maybe they shouldn't be responsible for. Maybe an old HVAC system, and now they're responsible for the cost of repair. I had a claim on that. I, large strip mall in the, in a South Metro suburb of the Twin Cities. I mean, large strip mall. It, 40 tenant unit and somebody went up on the roof and stole all the coils out of the air conditioners and the tenant was responsible for replacing the AC unit. And she's like, I'm a tenant in this building and I've got to replace a $15,000 HVAC unit. Are you kidding me? And I said, right. the insurance company's not going to cover it because you don't own the property, but you're responsible for it because you signed the lease agreement. She's like, what can I do to get out of this? I said, I'm not an attorney, better call one, but the insurance company is not going to cover this because you don't own the building. And lease agreements are written in a way that it's all, it's very difficult to get out of it. Extremely difficult. Another one that comes up in lease agreements is uh, that uh, tenants can get on the hook for capital improvements. So like the landlord can come in and make all sorts of capital improvements and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and then that cost gets added to their CAM cost or their operating cost that they it's proportionate with the other tenants. I had another that I had a vet that we had a fight with the landlord on that point as well. So, you know, and there's little things that you do in that sort of situation. You have to negotiate it. Maybe the landlord isn't going to agree to that. But then what you do is you say, okay, we're okay with paying for it but it has to be amortized over the life of the improvement so that you can spread that cost off over a 10 or 20 year period. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This episode of the Veterinary Blueprint Podcast is sponsored by Butler Vet Insurance. Being an insurance agent at Butler Vet Insurance, I've seen firsthand the difficulties veterinarians face insuring their practices. But do you know that we wrote the book on veterinary insurance? It's called Protecting Your Veterinary Practice, Insider Insurance Secrets Every Veterinarian Must Know. It's not just a book. It's a comprehensive guide that speaks to the unique challenges and in insurance solutions for the veterinary community. With over 20 years experience from cyber liability to business auto and workers' compensation, our aim at Butler Vet Insurance is to reduce the stress of insurance for those dedicated to animal care. If you're a veterinary practice owner or manager and looking for some guidance on your insurance, follow our insurance blueprint. Discover the Butler Vet Insurance difference. And together, let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. Butler Vet Insurance, reducing the stress of insurance. So, you know, I guess the, it's buyer beware. And these things are negotiable, right? I mean, it's it's a contractual agreement. It's not written in stone. I think for the veterinarians out there listening, if you get handed a lease agreement, you do not have to immediately sign it. To have and I mean, I, I did a, a acquisition where I I purchased another insurance agency, and I cannot tell you the investment that I made in working with a, a qualified, competent attorney who who has experience in the in the arena. It was worth every penny that I invested and I, it wasn't an expense. I didn't call it an expense. It was an investment because it saved me a lot of headache and time to make sure everything was proper and done along the way. And I think, um, 
you know, I think, you know, for my industry and probably yours, they look at us and say, oh God, I'm wasting money on insurance or I'm wasting money on an attorney. They're just out to make a buck off me. But um, long term, you can get into a lot of trouble either signing an agreement or not having enough insurance um, for, you know, speaking about our two industries. Um, what, what's a lot of so, uh, uh, There's two different types of leases. You have residential and commercial. Residential leases have a lot of protection under statute. So you have already, but on a commercial lease, you don't. The courts look at you and the legislature looks at you as your sophisticated business person. It's up to you to negotiate your own terms. So. Yeah. And, and I think that, again, it goes back to the original comment about building a trusted advisory board, so to speak, of attorneys, CPAs, uh, you know, insurance, um, HR, whatever that looks like to make sure that you're, because there, as you mentioned, there is a lot of um, consumer protection. It's same thing on the insurance side, right? So there's a lot of protection for personal insurance from the Department of Commerce, but it's buyer beware on the commercial line side. All of those consumer protections are not there because you're, now that you've formed a corporation and a legal entity that you've got to now report with the federal government through FinCEN, apparently, um, <laughs> you're a sophisticated business owner. You've, you, you, you know everything. So figure it out or we're going to come after you. Um, yeah, you're making a great point about the network too. So, you know, I tend to work in particular areas. But what I can be is I can be a point person for uh, vets as well. They can call me up. And if I can't do it, I, I know who can. So, you know, I'm a resource. I know the, I know the other uh, players out there that can help you, like Bill here on insurance. So Yeah. And, you know, speaking about contracts for a second, I know that there was um, one thing that I wanted to touch on because it was a very hot topic in my industry and I know there's there's um, some communication going out there inside the veterinary world about non-competes and uh, enforceability of non-competes. And um, there was some federal legislation that was uh, being floated. And then they did pass legislation in Minnesota about non-competes. What's your kind of thought process or attitude towards non-competes? And, and I know there's some other components to an employment agreement. First, I'm going to ask you this question. Should, should every employee at, at your practice have an employment agreement signed? Uh, no. I, I think uh, you have two tiers of employment legal documents. If you have DVMs working for you, you should have an employment agreement with them, professional employment agreement. All other, your techs and your business people or anybody else that you're employing, um, you can have a well-drafted employee handbook that can serve to provide all of the policy information that you need with regard to those individuals. And um, so I generally, you know, sometimes there's a case where a lesser employee, somebody not licensed might need an employment agreement but it, it comes up very rarely. Gotcha. And so within those, uh, specifically with the, with the DVMs, I, I think there's some, a lot of conversation out there right now. Um, there's a lot of corporate practices who are hiring DVMs. And I think there's some contention about their um, uh, non-compete clauses that are being put in there. Number one, in Minnesota specifically, what's the legality of non-competes? And then just generally overall, how enforceable are they as, as a uh, instrument in a con employment agreement? Okay, so the law changed on J July 1st. So as of July 1st, any new employment agreement or independent contractor agreement cannot have non-competes in them that exist after termination of employment. So you can, you can have non-compete provisions in an employment agreement during employment, but you can't have the, for two years after termination, you cannot um, compete. Practice with, medicine within five miles. Yeah. Area, right. that, 
those are void now and unenforceable. In the state of Minnesota. In the state of Minnesota, any new one. The existing ones that exist prior to July 1st are still enforceable. So if there's a current agreement out there, and my advice to young DVMs that have employment agreements is before you renew your employment agreement, you should get a brand new so that it can non-compete can be removed from it. So, gotcha. And then as far, I mean, in my industry, there's a lot of conversation about enforceability of non-competes where the, they don't actually really hold up in court that well. If I wanted to try and, you know, I've got someone working for me and they, you know, they leave the agency and they go work somewhere else. For me to try and go actually enforce that non-compete is a very hard uphill battle, but there's a couple other components to an employment agreement that's probably more critical to have in there, which is non-piracy, non-solicitation, especially in, in my realm. But do you want to talk about those two components of an employment agreement in relation yeah, to non-compete? Um, I think I think uh, in the insur insurance world, I think a little bit different. In the professional practice world, the non-competes, they did serve a value, I think, to a lot of doctors. But now that they're not enforceable, it's moved to non-solicitation, uh, non-disclosure of confidential information, and protection of uh, proprietary or trade secret information. And so those provisions, and now when I'm drafting those agreements, I'm really uh, bolstering up those provisions so that they're very strong and uh, expressed in a very explicit terms so the employee understands that they can't steal client lists, they can't provide, uh, you know. Work products, workflows, work, checklists, all of that, yeah. Exactly any of that information, they can't use any of that. So, um, and, and the other por point here that people should understand is in the transition, in a sale of a practice, this is one of the exceptions under the new Minnesota law. If I'm selling my veterinary practice and the buyer want, wants me to be under a non-compete, that's enforceable. Because so yeah, the, 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 the non-compete to a, correct, yeah. That was my understanding as well, Michael, is that the buyer seller transaction for non competition is very enforceable, but the employer employee non competition that, that, that went away. And so j just for the, the sake of, uh, trans, not transparency, but for the lay person out there, I work for you. I sign an employment agreement after July 1st. It doesn't contain a non compete, but it's got the non piracy, non disclosure, non solicitation, uh, components. I can open a practice next door to you but I can't take the client list. I can't take all the checklists and workflows. I can't call any of the clients that I used to see or patients that I used to see. Now, if they come, if they choose to come to my practice, cause they know that I, I'm practicing next door, the client can freely choose to do that, but I cannot solicit them to come to my new practice. Correct. And um, it, it gets, it gets a little bit gray here. All right, because uh, sometimes in a lot of times employment agreements, you'll have uh, attorney's fees provisions as well in these remedies. So as an employer, I can go after you as a former employee. And if I think you are violating the agreement and I can prove it, you have to pay my attorney's fees as well as your own to defend it. So that's kind of, you know, something else to keep in mind. But uh, you're correct. You cannot, you can't solicit. But the challenge there and the advice I give to my clients is, if you're going to do that, if you're going to open up across the street or next door or whatever you're going to do, and you have clients that you know are coming from that other practice, you better have good documentation of how that communication started. Or else, or else that employer can. But you open yourself up to lawsuit, right? You do. You absolutely do. So, and it's you, uh, sure you know the the agreement that, that. Yeah, definitely documented the the agreement that I had with the the prior owner of the practice, uh, the insurance agency that I acquired. It's 
lost revenue. It's I, I get to charge uh, a reasonable rate of the revenue that I anticipated that I lost on top of the attorney's fees. So it's not even just the attorney's fees. It's also the uh, lost revenue that I can justify having lost to your solicitation of uh, the clients. Um, you know, I think, you know, as business owners, we don't, we don't like to think about that, but it's, it's protection. You know, you have to take off your practitioner hat and put on your business owner hat and you really need to protect the practice. Do you think anyone is ever going to go out and steal your clients? No. However, ah, you never know what could happen. And, um, and that, that again, goes back to working with a, a knowledgeable, uh, legal professional who can help you draft documents that are going to protect your business. Um, one last item that, that I'd like to touch on just because it also is, is new law in Minnesota, um, specifically. And, and I think, you know, these types of laws, if you're not, uh, if you're veterinary, not in Minnesota, these types of laws are getting rolled out across the country. I think more and more States are, are looking to put these in, but it's Minnesota's safe and sick time law and how that can impact small businesses. And again, that, you know, the definition of small businesses. Uh, the, the, the legislative definition of small business, which I think is a, a revenue number and an employee number. But why don't you touch on some of the changes that are coming for um, small businesses uh, it just in general in Minnesota and how that might affect veterinarians? Well, um, I think the one that's coming up right now is, and that starts at the beginning of this next year is the safe and, uh, sick and safe time law. and and, and if you have one employee, you're subject to it. So basically. So that's how small you are. One employee, you're subject to the Minnesota safe and sick law effective January 1st. Right, Michael? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. And what it says is that uh, employees are, will, are legally or employers are legally required to allow employees to accrue one hour for every 30 hours worked, uh, up to a maximum of 48 hours a year. So you have to allow up to 48 hours of sick, safe and sick time Yeah, for like one hour for every 30 hours worked. If somebody works 2,000 hours a year, you divide that by 30 hours, that comes up to about 66 hours of, of, you know, paid or safe, uh, sick or safe time. You only but I can cap it at 48? 48. 48. Yeah, you can cap it at 48. Okay. And, but the other really, <clears throat> excuse me, the other really important part of this is what you're going to use it for. And what they can use it for is uh, for their own care of a family member with a mental or physical illness or for medical diagnosis or preventive medical or health care, uh, for domestic abuse, sexual assault, seeking medical attention or services or psychological help or relocation or seeking legal advice. Um, and, and it's not just for you, but it can be for a, fa a family member and they really, uh, the definition of family. It's a very broad very, definition of family member, right? I mean, it's like. Yeah, it's child, foster child, adult child, legal ward, child of whom the employee is a legal guardian, a child of whom the employee stands or stood in uh, as a parent, uh, spouse or registered partner, sibling, step sibling, foster sibling, biological, adoptive, foster parent, step parent grandchild, foster grandchild, grandparent, grandparent, child of a sibling, a sibling of parents. Child, child so a niece or nephew. Sibling. I could take time off for a niece or nephew's illness. Your, your niece or nephew. And then the other part is you can name up to one designated individual that you're not even related to. So I could name you, if you were sick, off. I could say, I'm going to go buy Michael some chicken soup. I need the day off. You got to give it to me. Exactly. If I'm your guy, you're, you're protected under the law. You might be my guy, Michael. I might make you my guy. <laughs> I might make you my guy for the safe and sick. Now, I, I think this affects every business in a different way, right? I mean, you know, um, in, in, in our industry, 
we're a little bit more flexible, right? So, um, you know, I have a team member out right now. Um, she's, she's pretty ill and she's a hybrid, high, works hybrid. So she spends part of the time in the office and part of the time at home. And, and this January, I decided I'm just going to go to unlimited PTO. I know that that's, that's kind of the other end of the business spectrum. And I said, I'm not going to get into trying to track hours and track time. And if you need a time off, just take time. But I know that there's a lot of businesses out there that can't afford that sort of uh, leniency or scheduling and and that sort of thing. So how does a business who isn't tracking specifically one hour for every 30 hours, how does that play in? Well, you need to show it on their paycheck. And you still need to show it on their paycheck, regardless of how your PTO is set up. Okay, so I need to show that they're accruing this time that they can be used for safe and sick time. Correct. So that means you need to work with a really good CPA and or payroll provider that's Correct. got your back, even if you have unlimited. So again, back to our network of professional providers is to make sure that they're in tune with what's happening in, in your state or, or um, cause I think, you know, more and more, um, you know, and that, we put it in, I put that in place for my team just because I did not want them. I, um, I had a team member last year whose husband needed a knee surgery and she, you know, we were kind of looking at PTO hours and she was kind of getting to the end of her PTO. And I was like, I really don't want my team worrying about whether or not they have the availability to take time off to care for a spouse and whether or not they're going to be short five hours or 10 hours in a pay period or something like that. And again, I, I know every business and every, um, every practice is in a different spot, but, um, now working, you know, i I've got a couple notes here that I, I got to reach out to my uh, attorney. Uh, may, maybe Michael's my guy to make sure I'm compliant with Sinfin on the um, on the on the uh, corporate, corporate transparency corporate. act. But then also, you know, communicate with my CPA and payroll provider. Hey, am I making sure, even though I offer unlimited PTO, that I'm tracking this Minnesota safe and sick time? And I think that you know the intention is. We don't want employees th thinking or worrying about having to take time off for all the reasons that you you highlighted, right? Um, which I, I think we'll both agree are both valid reasons to be uh, off of work for a certain period of time and not have to worry about losing wages for doing that. But from a business owner side, it's making sure that you're tracking that so you don't do not run afoul of the law, and that that those things are in place at, at your business or practice. And, the, and, the, uh, and, and along with that, you have to provide the employees notice of their rights under the law by posting or it. Or else you're in trouble again. And the penalty is because it's the government is are stiff, as you would say. The employees know about it, and it has to be in their primary yeah. language. And, and it also, um, if you have an um, employee handbook, you need to update the handbook so it exists in there as well. So... You know, you know, there's a lot of little things about this. I could probably talk for an hour and a half on this alone, but yeah, good points on this. Well, I, I really appreciate the time today. And I think the, the, the key takeaway from all of this, whether you're domiciled in Minnesota as a veterinary practice or another state is to make sure that you're networking and connecting with, um, you know, professionals and, and, you know, Michael and I know each other through the Minnesota veterinary medical association and, and your state association is a great spot to network with um, professionals who understand your industry. Just as a plug, whether you know you're you're you are in Minnesota or Texas, uh, where Michael works, you can always reach out to him, and, and we'll get that info in a second. Or just you know reach out to your state association and look for those professionals because you want to make sure as these legislation uh, legislative actions take place that that you're up to date with making sure that you're compliant and um, not going to run afoul of that. I really enjoyed our time today, Michael. For, for our listeners out there who are in Minnesota or Texas, I know you're, you're in the bar in Wisconsin as well. Um, how, how, do, uh, how do veterinarians find you out there in the world? Well, uh, I'm an industry partner with the Minnesota Med uh, Veterinary Medical Association, so you can go to that website and my information is there. Otherwise, you can uh, shoot me an email. And my email address is M as in Michael, S as in Sam, A L C H E R T at Larkin, L A R K I N, Hoffman, 
H-O-F-F-M-A-N.com. So, and I think you're on LinkedIn as well. So we'll make sure to have that. We'll make sure to have that contact info out there as well for LinkedIn if they want to connect with you that way. So, well, I've really enjoyed our time together, Michael. Thanks for being a guest on the podcast. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate being on. It was great. And uh, as always, uh, for our listeners out there, make sure to like, uh, share, and review the podcast. It helps with the algorithms out there and the Internet so that other veterinarians and practice managers Uh, veterinary professionals can get the podcast. So tune into the next episode of the Veterinary Blueprints podcast, where we bring business and entrepreneurship principles to the veterinary community. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to Veterinary Blueprints. If you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions for an episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at bill at butlervetinsurance.com. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you could do me a huge favor, you know it helps with the algorithm. If you can like, share, or comment on the post, leave a review, I would love it. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.